I, I call this fragments of a, a lost homeland of art as testimony and witnessing. Now, I use the art of photography both as a, as a form of testimony and of witnessing for the cultural and material and human loss that resulted from the Armenian Genocide. And I wanted to say just a few words about what I mean by this. I'm not gonna read a paper, but there are a few passages I want to articulate here. Now, in my work, which I call memory work, or just memory work, justice is important here with regard to the memory work I do, I combine photography with a narrative framework that is rich with storytelling. And in my book, I tell many stories. Both Peter and I grew up hearing many stories. And I've been given many stories by the rich memoirs that have been passed on to me. Unlike uh, many families who don't have any written stories in their family, uh, I'm blessed with three written accounts. My grandfather wrote a memoir, my great uncle, his brother, wrote a memoir, and their sister's daughter wrote a memoir. So I have, I have both the male perspective on how things happen in, in Armenia, and I have the, the female perspective on uh, what happened. So I hear a lot in the memoirs about cooking and kitchens and marriages and jewelry and all those things that uh, you don't necessarily find in, in the male memoirs. And I use these memoirs and the photographs that I've been uh, blessed with uh, to bring to life what Armenian life was like <coughs> in the Ottoman Empire before the genocide, but also after the genocide, because my family remained in, in what is now Turkey until the end of 1922. I use the, the concepts of testimony and bearing witness broadly in order to highlight two related but distinct aspects of my memory work. Now, testimony is related to historical truth for the most part. It provides sort of evidence for the experience of 1915. Um, it's almost like a, jur a juridical sense. Uh, the images and the, the stories document what happened to the Armenians. But witnessing, witnessing bearing witness uh, captures something different. In a sense, it captures the experience of how the Armenians felt about what they were going through. Uh, it gives them a voice, a voice that might have been silenced for a number of reasons, sometimes silenced in Peter's case uh, by the trauma, other times silenced by living in Turkey today, where Armenians could not talk about their past. Uh, so I used both this idea of, of testimony and witnessing um, to talk about uh, the Armenian story in many, many venues. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today, the memory work I am doing. And I, I want to highlight the, the, the audience for my work. I really see four distinct audiences, often but sometimes overlapping audiences. One are the Armenians in the diaspora, people here coming to these kinds of talks. Next important audience are the Armenians in Turkey and in the Republic of Armenia. And there are distinct audiences there who have different kinds of experiences. We have in the Republic of Armenia, Armenians who are struggling for, in a sense, for survival in their nation that's surrounded by many, many enemies. In Turkey, we have Armenians who are, uh, are in fear, many, in many cases, of, of, of openly identifying themselves as Armenians. 
The other, the third important audience, are Turkish citizens. Because I have long ago decided that I don't want to just tell this story to the Armenian audience, but I want to tell this story to a Turkish audience. I want them to understand, in a sense, the trauma, to understand the pain that our families and generations of our families have faced with the genocide. And finally, the fourth audience is the general public, um, both in the United States and in the UK and now um, here in Australia because I'll be speaking at the State Library here in Sydney next Thursday to a general audience uh, about fam family histories and photography. And I've, 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 I've done that in a number of venues. Excuse me for, I have this lingering cough. I've done this in a number of venues over, over the years. Now, of course, uh, the next question I answer is, why, why the need for this memory work? And, and in, in part, this is because of the uniqueness of our, our genocide. And of course, every genocide is different. Every genocide has some aspects that are similar to other <coughs> genocides. But what's, what's unique about our genocide is, is denial. Uh, and it's, it's the case that with our genocide, certainly for the first 50 years after 1915, there was, there was much silence and forgetting. Some of that was orchestrated intentionally by the Republic of Turkey, but much of it was created by uh, Armenians trying to recover their lives and to move on in, in the diaspora. But this, this, this started to change um, in 1965. That was the 50th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, and that's when in Yerevan and in communities, diaspora and communities around the world, Armenians first started to have public commemorations of the genocide. I don't know what the story was here in, in uh, Australia. Do you know when was the first public commemoration of, of the genocide? 1965. Uh, our reverend said that from now we're not gonna try, uh, cry or anything because we survive. We should see our future. Mm -hmm. I remember. Great, great. Because I remember as a 13-year-old, or 13-year-old, being in the first public commemoration demonstration in New York City for the Armenian Genocide. And there have been many, many more since then. So, as I said, things started to change since 1965, and um, in Turkey, of course, things didn't change very much at all for the next 20, 30 years. It wasn't until 2005, and I'm not gonna go through a long sort of narrative history, but it wasn't until 2005 when there was the first public scholarly event about the Armenian Genocide, and it was a conference originally scheduled for Bokasici University, Bosporus University, a state university, the conference was Ottoman Armenians during the decline of the empire. Didn't use the genocide word in the title. And many of the papers weren't acknowledging or accepting the, the terminology genocide. Of course, there was a lot of pressure against this conference. It was blocked. Eventually, it was held in September. It was originally supposed to be in May in Bilgi University, another university, which was a private university, and somehow they were able to to, to hold it. Um, the other, the next big event, and you know, I'm gonna sort of skip these slides, but uh, since Peter made the AGBU connection, I, I wanna just point out this one photograph. It's not very clear, is it? Um, this is the, the Marzavan uh, AGBU uh, mm -hmm. of leadership in 1910, okay? Um, and, uh, the, the, the individual on the far right 
is uh, Professor uh, Kavork Gulian, who wrote an important grammar book that's still in, in, in print called Elementary Modern Armenian Grammar. You can still go on Amazon and get it. Uh, he was a professor at Anatolia College and played an important role in that secret on top that you will read about in my book. He was the professor who gave my family their Turkish names, their Turkish identities, uh, because that's how they, they survived in, in 1915. Uh, they became secret Armenians. They became Turkified and Islamicized Armenians for the duration of the war. Are any of them survived in that photo? Gulian did. He did. Uh, most of the others didn't. But Gulian did and, and left. Uh, at the end of the war. Um, the next important event in, in the story is in 2007 was the assassination of Hiram Dink. Uh, now this was, this was a great tragedy for Armenians, but it was a watershed moment in Turkey because of the response of the public. And I don't know if you can see this image there were hundreds of thousands of people who came out for the funeral, uh, identified themselves with Armenians. And this began a process over the next 10 years of uh, more and more public events related to the Armenian genocide. The first commemoration, public commemoration of the genocide in Taksim Square was in 2010, and there's been one every year since then. In my talk, that I gave in Brisbane at the conference that Peter and I attended, I, I, I gave us a more detailed summary of all the different kinds of artistic events that took place in those in this period that I'm discussing. But we don't have, <coughs> I don't have time to talk about the other artistic events. I want to talk about the, the parts of my project, my Just Memory project, and they, they consist in three parts. The first are the photography exhibitions that Sarkis mentioned. I've had four exhibitions in Turkey, in Istanbul, Ankara, Diyarbakir, where Peter's uh, grandmother was from, and also in Marzavan, which is where my family came from, besides having exhibitions in the United States and in, in London. The second part are the books and publications that I've brought out, and the media articles, newspaper articles and such. And the final part, if we have time, will be the sites of memory. Now, photography is at the heart of all of this. And photography began in my family in 1888 with my grandfather, Solak Rikor Dildilian, who began as a photographer in 1888, as I said, in Sivas and Sebastia. And members of the family continued photography well into the 1980s. So it's almost 100 years of photography in, in the family. There were two generations of photographers. I would have been the third. I have my camera with me, but no one pays me for my photography, so I don't know if I, I, I count. But even my mother was a photographer uh, for a period of time in Greece before coming to the United States. Um, as, as Peter's uh, uh, pointed out with, with, with his mother who had gotten a, a, a degree, my, my mother, she gave up the photography when she married, married my father. This is, a, this is an example of a panoramic photograph that my grandfather took of Marzavon taken in about uh, 1912. And those buildings up on the hillside are the Armenian church and the Armenian <coughs> schools. And as you pan along into the Armenian neighborhood of, of Marzavan, you start to get to these white buildings that are part of Anatolia <coughs> College, where uh, my grandfather was the official photographer in this image is my, my family's ancestral home uh, and the hospital that was part of, of uh, Anatolia College. 
the, this is an example of the kind of amazing photography that the, my grandfather started. He, he took many, many of these panoramic photographs. And unlike our iPhones where you put it on pan panorama and you go like this, you have to take, in some cases I have examples of 12 images that are all have to be attached together. There's no Photoshop there, so this is all, all in, in the dark room. Um, this is just a, a, a still from there. Um, and in that image is this house, my parents' home built by my grandfather. You can see the odd uh, roof line because there's a glass ceiling there and there's a glass wall. Uh, <coughs> photo studios needed northern light. The photography was either done outdoors or when it was done in the studio, it was done with natural light. Um, and that was the family home. Uh, this is taken out of a panorama. Um, I don't know if you can see, but there's some laundry hanging in the window, which my grandfather must have been annoyed when he, he came back and developed this this 12-part panorama and saw laundry hanging out of this. He said something to his, my grandmother about, <laughs> Uh, so I've, I've taken these photographs and I have somewhere about 900 or 1,000 photographs between 1888 and 1922 when they left. Of course, I have hundreds and hundreds of more photographs in Greece where they resumed their photography business. Um, and then I have some glass negatives, which I find <coughs> mind-boggling that these glass negatives from Marzavan to Samsun, from Samsun to uh, Piraeus, from Piraeus to uh, New York, from New York to Hartford, Connecticut, from Connecticut to my house, and they, for the most part, are still being had. So I've taken these photographs and created exhibitions in Turkey, uh, as I said, in four cities, and uh, I would like to do more, but it might be a difficult time to do it, but I'm still committed to, to this project. The first one was in, in Istanbul. This was in 2013. This is the image of the, the poster for it. It's my grandfather with the beard, his, his younger brother above him who joined the photography business after studying photography in the United States. He came to the United States in, in 1906. Uh, went to Illinois, went to the first photography school in the United States, learned the business of photography, went to Pittsburgh and tried to open, open a few studios. He found himself very homesick and returned to his hometown of Marzwan and joined his brother in the studio. And uh, next to him is their sister who plays an important role in the family narrative. Um, and these are just examples <coughs> Of uh, photos taken, uh, these are photos taken of the exhibition. As you can see, these are huge enlargements, uh, somewhere like six, eight feet tall of these images. So you can, the, the resolution of the photographs on glass negatives is so high that you can blow them up taller than a human being in many cases. So this is, uh, this is, examples of, of some of the large portraits they produced. Um, they had clientele that were Greek and Armenian, and they also had Turkish clientele. But most of the photographs that are in the family collection are of Armenians uh, in, in Greece and members of the family. Um, we had quite a bit of narrative information, and we used the word soikru, genocide, in this exhibition. Uh, we, we, we didn't censor it. It wasn't a, an exhibition about genocide, but it was an exhibition that didn't hide the fact that there was this event that Ar Armenians in the world acknowledged as, as the genocide. We had a few examples of the original photographs there. Uh, I was very reluctant initially to have any there, but uh, there was I was comfortable enough at the end that we, we included some, some photographs. Um, this is one of my uncles who
who uh, for a while was one of the photographers in the, um, in the business, but then went on to be a chemist and an engineer. And um, I don't know if this is going to work, but let me see. Uh, my name is Ara. <coughs> Can you hear that? Yeah. This is an interview he did, as you see, 1968, that we created and included in the exhibition. And of course, we had Turkish subtitles for people to understand. And this, 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 this narrative tells about his experience in I'm going to just uh, skip ahead to one moment. Um, we had these two, two videos that ran constantly um, in a loop, and they were both about 12 minutes. We edited down uh, two and a half hours of, of material for this interview and the second interview with my mother. But I just want to play you one, <coughs> one, one section describing his memory of what happened in 1915 uh, in the deportations. People were allowed to take just a few of their belongings and you'd see them go and hand was dead go and uh, up the hill, our house was on a hill, they had to go that way and, uh, and it's surprising. She said, keep the baby, and we kept the baby. And that baby stayed with us until the war was over. We found his grandmother. Grandmother stayed with us later on. And he is in Bristol. And that, that's the 
that's the way it happened, I think. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> It, this particular video was was quite moving for a lot of people to hear um, because it's heart rendering describing what happened. I don't know if you understood this neighbor's family's being deported and they give their baby to my uncle to keep and the baby stayed with, with the, the family, with our family. Um, I won't be able to play this, but uh, this is this is another video, but this is actually a video interview of my my mother, which I... Hi, Mom. Mm -hmm. Bye, Mom. Mm -hmm. uh, she talks about why, she talks about the photography business and why they were um, not deported. Um, the most moving experience with the exhibitions were to taking, taking the exhibition to the hometown, because I took it to Marzavan wow. that same year, and the whole experience of taking these these images that were that were of this community that were taken in this community it was like bringing the family back home, and um, and I was for the most part very welcomed in the town. Um, people wanted to know about the Armenian presence, uh, and they. Uh, invited us to bring an exhibition here. We had to recreate the whole exhibition because the venue was quite different. It was a Tashan, uh, a 16th century uh, merchant's uh, quarters and market. And uh, we, we had these, uh, it's a historic building, so we had to redo everything on these panels and hang them in the, in the, uh, in the building. Um, and we even had the Chamber of Commerce donate some money for reception for the opening and the mayor was there. All of this is mind-boggling for someone who grew up uh, with certain images of, of Turks and the Turkish denial, okay? Uh, but we have to be much more sensitive in Marzvan than we were in this time. Uh, it's a more conservative place and it was a more nationalist place. So um, uh, we have to be very careful in the language we use but we also did an outreach to the schools in, Mars, in Marzalan. And these are three, four students that I met. I visited their school, which used to be a part of a, a college uh, hospital that now is, now is a school. Uh, and they came to the exhibition. Um, but we, but we uh, as you see, they also have the, the booklets in their hands of the exhibition. And the booklets, in the booklets, we, if they're in Turkish, we do use the word Soykarim, genocide. So even though it wasn't, wasn't in the exhibition itself, we sort of slipped it in their hands. Um, but we, uh, we encountered one mistake. The night before the exhibition was to open, uh, we discovered that there was a passage that we failed to remove the Turkish word Soykarim. It says, it, the translation is April 24th is indelibly marked in the memory of the Armenians as the Mevz Yergen. And we use that term intentionally instead of genocide. But then we said, becoming the date on which they will commemorate the Armenian genocide for generations to come. And so we were, we were perplexed about what to do. The panels, fortunately, that dealt with the year 1915 were in black with white lettering. All the other panels were white with black lettering. So we took a piece of black tape and covered the, the Turkish word soykarim over uh, so it didn't appear. Of course, that drew a lot of attention. So <laughs> in its absence, it was more present than it would have been if we used, used the word. Because everybody came and they knew what the word was there. Then taking it to Peter's, uh, Peter's home uh, town for his grandmother was Diyabakir. Uh, here we were able to use the Serpiragos Church, which was restored at that time, just the year before, as the venue for the exhibition. Uh, we used the porticos and there were some uh, rooms next to the church that we used for the, for, for the purposes of the exhibition. And uh, unlike Istanbul and Marzavan, we used additional languages here. We used Kurdish, and we also created a panel in Armenian, because in Diyarbakir, 
the Kurdish mayor has been uh, quite, had been at this time quite supportive of the Armenian, re Armenian genocide recognition and had used the word, he used the language and the signs. Uh, the final <coughs> exhibition was in Ankara. This was, the, was <coughs> quite groundbreaking in the sense that this was the first time we used a government facility for the exhibition. This was the Municipal Art Center of Chanka, which is the central district in Ankara. It's the heart of the Turkish uh, capital, the, the parliament, uh, and a number of government buildings are just in the neighborhood. Uh, and this was a major gallery uh, with a lot of space, so we had an ability to use uh, quite an extensive floor. As you can see, the black, we still kept the black images, the black background for 1915. And in this exhibition, we took the ball step of leaving the word Soikarum genocide in. Um, this is just an overview of it. Of course, that created a scandal. This is a couple of newspaper articles <coughs> were written. Um, this is the CHP municipal exhibition scandal. The CHP is the opposition party, so the newspapers who were AKP, Erdogan's party, wrote these scathing criticisms of the mayor and the fact that he let this exhibition take place. The mayor, to his credit, issued a press release defending the, the, not the content of the exhibition, but he said, we, we tolerate uh, multiple voices in, in, in this uh, gallery. Uh, let me move on to the publications. I published the book you see out there uh, with, with the hundreds of photographs. The first version of that came out in Istanbul in January of 2015. Uh, this text is bilingual, it's English and Turkish. Uh, it has many of those photographs, but the version you have has additional photographs because I expanded the story into the 1920s and 30s and telling the story in Greece and using photographs in Greece. So I've made this available in Turkey. It's, it's, it's available today. Um, the Fragments of a Lost Homeland, which you see there, has been translated into Turkish and will be published at the end of the year after long delays. And of course, in this book, the word is used. Again, none of these books are about just the genocide. It's about Armenian life in this period, the rich cultural life and the family story. And the genocide, of course, is in the middle of that experience. Um, and these books have been written about, this is in the English version, the Horiat. Uh, this came out just in April. This is sort of a book review about it. There have been many Turkish publications about it, about my work, about the books. I've been on the radio, I've been on uh, Turkish TV. Unlike Peter, I don't get on American television. <laughs> I get, get on Turkish television. <laughs> Though I haven't I hadn't seen much of what has been broadcast, though a cousin in, Mon in, in London once uh, called me up and said, you know, I went into this little grocery store run by, by Turks, and uh, the, the TV was playing uh, a <laughs> Turkish station, and I saw you being interviewed. Uh, I'm gonna skip these. These are other <coughs> exhibitions that I played a role in uh, that took place in, in 2016, and I wanna move on to the uh, <clears throat> last part of my talk uh, um, about the sites of memory, uh, but <coughs> before <coughs> before I do this and before I lose my voice, actually, um, I just want to read uh, a couple of small uh, moments out of out of my book. And as, since I don't have to uh, turn the uh, the slides, um, I'll, I'll stand here and, and read this. And I much prefer moving around when I, when, I, when I talk. This is this is from the opening, the introduction of my book. And it, again, it connects with Peter's work because it also mentions uh, my grandmother. Uh, so I begin my book with these words. I recall as a young child, 
often entering my grandmother's dimly lit and sparingly furnished bedroom. Sitting on a small nightstand next to her tiny bed was a little wooden framed photograph of a handsome bearded man, a man with very beautiful and penetrating eyes. This was my grandfather, Solar Gildonian, a grandfather I never knew. He had died many years before in some far off land. He was seldom talked about, at least in front of my brother and myself. Did I ask Meds Myri, the Armenian word for grandmother, about the photo? <clears throat> I do not recall. My child's curiosity did sometimes make me wonder about the photos of adults. What did these people look like as children? What did a beardless grandfather look like in his childhood? More than 50 years later, I still cannot answer this question, yet I do know more, a lot more about my grandfather. I shall tell you his story and the story of my Armenian family. I first began hearing fragments of this story as a child growing up in an immigrant Armenian family in New York City. The story was conveyed to me not in a typical narrative with the beginning, middle, and end. Often these stories weren't being told to me at all. They were overheard snippets of conversation. At first they were words and phrases spoken in odd moments, sometimes with odd names, and often about unknown yet exotic sounding places. Marzabon, Turkia, Bolis, Haracha, Samsun, Palu, Yozga, Halev, Girard, Aksor, the orphans, the college, the studio, or as my mother used to say, the atelier. Words spoken in English, in Armenian, and in a language I was not meant to understand, Turkish. There were also photographs, a few, <coughs> not many. There was that bearded man, distinguished looking, my grandfather, whose photograph had rested for a brief time in the twilight of my grandmother's bedroom. There, were also, there was also my grandmother, whose presence animated our household, for she lived with us during the last years of her life. She was a living, though often silent, reminder of a time long past. The mysterious scar on her arm that she bore with dignity told a story that I was only to learn years later, the story of her terrifying escape from the roof of her burning home during the Hamadian massacres of 1895. As I grew older, some of these fragments slowly <coughs> began to come together. They were snapshots into a distant time and place whose boundaries remained indistinct to me. So if you want the rest, you'll need to, to <laughs> read it. And let me just then conclude with the third part, and I'll try to make this as brief as possible, because uh, I know it's, it's been a long evening. The third part has to do with sites of memory, physical sites of memory. This is, as I said, was a, a close-up of the family home. This is what my family home looks today. Um, I visited it maybe half a dozen times. The owners are very welcoming. Uh, they keep saying that the next time I come to Marzwan, I'm going to have to sleep in my mother's bedroom. This family uh, wasn't in Marzwan in 1915. They were in, in, in what is now Greece, uh, near uh, Thessaloniki, uh, uh, Salonika. They were part of the population exchange in 1923. They came to Marzavan about a year after our family moved out, and they were the lucky ones. They got the thing of our house, which was one of the best houses in the town. It had hot and cold running water, which was uh, quite unique in, when the house was built in, in 1906. You can see the roof. The glass is not there, but you can see the indentation in the roof. This is our next door neighbor's house, Professor Hagopian, a distinguished uh, scholar of the languages and law. Um, it's being renovated uh, by uh, an open-minded Turk who has asked me for all the information I can give him about the prior owner of the house. 
and he is uh, he has put a plaque up on the house identifying uh, it as this Armenian professor's home. That's that's a copy of the book, and that's uh, that one of the books that Hagopian published. Uh, this is another home um, that is actually for sale. This is, uh, but I've heard that someone has bought it and is going to renovate it. The mayor of the town is providing funds to do the restoration of many of these old Armenian Ottoman homes. This was owned by the music professor, Daglian, who also survived the genocide by, uh, by, by being uh, hidden in a, in a German uh, agricultural farm but it also is probably the case he had to take Turkish identity too. Uh, this is one of the colleges, uh, part of Anatolia College, in one of the buildings. Uh, there's a postcard based on a family photograph. Um, this is the, the hospital uh, where my grandfather also worked, not just as a photographer, but ran the first x-ray machine in, in, in this part of Turkey. Unfortunately, it was before they knew anything about radiation, so he developed cancer of the jaw many years later because of exposure to the radiation and it took his life. Uh, this is the hospital today. It's been turned into a, a, a school, a high school. I visited the school, talked to the students and the director who was in this picture, uh, and I told him he had no idea what the building was. I told him it was a hospital. I told him that the Armenian doctors worked there, my grandfather worked there, and he said, can I have old photographs? So I made enlargements, and they're now in the hallways, and they're all identified with captions. So students know that this was what it, what it was 100 years ago. This is just an example of many of the Armenian uh, homes, especially of the professors. This is what it looks like, one of the houses today. But this is the North College, which is in ruins. Um, and uh, above is the groundbreaking for building that <coughs> building, and below is the groundbreaking that took place last year for the restoration of this building. It's going to be a museum, and we're going to make an effort to have many of the photographs in, in the museum there. Uh, and last, uh, this was a discovery I made outside of outside of Marizavan. This, this is, uh, it looks like a barn, but it turns out to be a chapel of the monastery of Surp uh, Aspat uh, And that chapel I talk about in, in, in my memoir because it plays many important roles, including this is where the Armenians were gathered before the deportation. Uh, some of the frescoes are still have some color in them. Uh, and this was one of the rooms in the monastery where my mother probably, as a one-year-old, uh, was, uh, uh, oh, well, was she, I don't know if she was baptized there, but in the, in the memoir it tells that uh, my, my, gran <clears throat> my grandmother was not feeling well, uh, and in order to help her recover, uh, they took my, my mother out to the monastery with, with her aunt <coughs> to take care of her. And of course, she she uh, uh, she cried a lot and kept up everybody. But this is now a falling. But uh, so that's the work I'm doing. I'm, I'm as I said, uh, these are ongoing projects. Uh, you might ask, how can I do this with great difficulty? Um, it's very uh, diplomatic. I have to be in in, in in with these projects, and of course since the attempted coup last year and the <coughs> repression that's taken place in Turkey, it's been much more difficult. But thank you for your attention. I know it's been a long night, um, and I appreciate your uh, interest in my work. Shinori um, <laughs>